to the latest edition of James Beard Media Awards at Home, presented by Capital One. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. If this is your first time to the series, I just want to tell you a little bit about it. JBF started the series as a way to honor our media award winners. As you know, lots of big events were canceled because of COVID-19, including the, James, the annual James Beard Award ceremonies. We announced the winners online in the spring, but we wanted to do a little bit more. So we've invited them back so that we can showcase and celebrate their work one more time. I'm Debbie Mitchell, and I'll be moderating while sheltering at home in Orlando, Florida. Use this time to check in with us on, our, on the Beard F Foundation Facebook page and YouTube channel to tell us where you are and to post your questions and comments throughout the conversation. I will try to get to as many of the questions as I can, and hopefully we'll get as many answers as we can. I have been on the James Beard Broadcast Media Awards Committee for almost 10 years. During that time, I've seen a lot of change and all for the good. I'm a television, an Emmy-nominated television producer by profession, right now working in the digital space producing virtual events such as these. I've seen a lot of change in the media in all the different genres, news, daytime, and food media. Today we're gonna to talk about how representation in the food media needs to change. But first, let's get to our guests. Patty, Patty Hinnich is the host of Patty's Mexican Table. Hi, Patty. Hey, Debbie, so <laughs> good to see you here. Good to Thank see you. Thank you so much for inviting me in. Oh, absolutely, I'll be right back, okay? Mark Fennell, is the host and producer of the podcast, It Burns. Hi, Mark. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. And Amanda Clute is editor-in-chief of one of the most recognizable food and dining network sites around, Eater. Hi, Amanda. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna get back to all of you in a little while, but I'm first gonna start the conversation with Patty. Okay, Patty. Hey. Hi. So you won, this is your, is it your third James Beard Award? Congratulations. Which yeah. is like unbelievable. Oh. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, oh Thank you. Yeah. You are so welcome. You're so welcome. You're obviously hitting a note with the viewers and our judges. So I remember when I first saw, when, when did you first submit? Uh, oh my gosh. I think it was 2011, Debbie. Yeah. 2011? Okay. 2011. So. 12 maybe, yeah. Okay, so that's when we first saw you, yeah, because that's when I started. And it was such a nice breath of fresh air. So tell me a little bit about Patty's Mexican Table, the premise of, of the course. show. Mm -hmm. Of course, okay, so Patty's Mexican Table, I started kind of um, as a rebel because um, there wasn't any Mexican in the US who was showcasing or portraying Mexicans, Mexican food, Mexican cuisine. And when I started, um, I really wanted to break myths and preconceptions about who we Mexicans are, what we eat, what our culture is. And I wanted to help build bridges between the US and Mexico, between the Mexican communities and the US and Mexico, and you know, for people here to understand their neighbor better. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I started trying to do these, I kept getting asked to do things that weren't Mexican. I kept being asked to do, you know, a Latin show about pan Latin food. Mm -hmm. I kept getting asked to like change my accent and take classes because people thought that my accent was too heavy, that I was too Mexican, that mm -hmm. my food was too Mexican, too ethnic. And I kept being pushed mm -hmm. to do many, many, many things and go on different routes than what I felt I was going to be proud about. Um, mm -hmm in the future and for me good authentic transparent content with a mission has always been my goal mm -hmm. so i took the most difficult route and and and, and started it paid um, off. Party, yeah party's mexican table yeah there yeah. were i mean it's every year of course it's every season is as difficult to pull together as the pa the the last one but the first one and the second one were, of course, like many times I thought I was just going to have to just drop the towel because it was 
so many obstacles people ask me if you knew what you know now would you do it again and i always say Debbie. I'm so happy that I didn't know all the obstacles that I was going to meet and all of the challenges that I was going to face. I had many ideas, but they just kept hitting me in the face. Mm -hmm. and if I had known, I would have been frozen on my tracks and I wouldn't have known how to go about it. So I'm kind of um, grateful that I was so incredibly enthusiastic about my mission and what I wanted to do. And I wanted to build this platform for others to share who we are um so, yeah i'm gonna tell let's i want before we go any further i want the audience to see a clip but hold on you want in the broadcast media category of television program in studio or fixed location for the episode entitled a locals tour of kulia khan let's take a look at a clip perfect Hola, bienvenidos a Sinaloa. I find myself here with a man who can't seem to wipe the smile off his face. Miguel Taniyama is one of Sinaloa's most acclaimed chefs, and he's giving me a tour of his hometown. From markets to street food to homestyle meals, I'm getting a taste of everything Culiacán has to offer. It's gorgeous! In my kitchen, recipes inspired by my day in Culiacán. Everything that goes into this taquito has to be delicious. Ah, that looks so good. Oh my gosh, Patty, can you still, can you hear me? Oh, I think she's frozen. See, this is what happens on live TV. <laughs> okay, we'll just keep going. We're gonna get her back. So the show, the premise of the show is that Patty and her crew will go to a, lo a specific location in Mexico. She will interview uh, the locals, uh, the, the um, get a, a history of the area, taste a couple of different meals, and then come back to her kitchen and prepare different meals from that area. So I was just telling them, Patty, the premise of the show, how it works, that you go to the location and then you come back into the studio and you prepare the food. So tell me why you chose Culiacan. Well, you know, what's happened, Debbie, is as the seasons, as, as we've moved further into the seasons, every time that we jump into the next season, we want to jump into much more substantial topics. and we grow bolder and more adventurous and want to really dive into places that need um, their stories to be told. So everybody knows Sinaloa uh, because of Narcos and because of El Chapo, and they have such an incredibly bad reputation in media. But mm -hmm. Sinaloa is a state that mostly gives and gives and gives and grows most of the food and produce that's not only eaten in the rest of Mexico, but exported to the U.S., Oh. And it has families, you know, like their family and entrepreneurial values are incredible. And the people there are just so tired and they've been so negatively impacted by these narcos and these, you know, these these single unidimensional stories that are mm -hmm. told that I really felt like we needed to go there and let people share their stories and show how there's not just one side to things. And it was so incredibly humbling and you know it was just incredible to learn the stories from Sinaloa from the ground up and as the seasons go by Debbie I realize that I want to go more and I want to take people along with me to places that I want to explore my, myself and I realize the more I'm here the less I know about my own home country and about Mexicans north and south of the border. So, so I know that uh, when I think of Mexican food, I have a specific image in my mind. What's what's indicative of food in that area of that region? What's so that's what's fascinating. The food from Sinaloa has these amazing, bold, pristine ingredients. They have, you know, oysters the size of your hand and scallops the size of my head, and they have incredible wow. food. So their, their food is very, very simple. They make the ingredients shine with as little as possible, and it's very Northern style. Yeah, You know, like the techniques, the emphasis are on like grilling, charring, or fresh. Mm -hmm. or you know very simple ingredients but there's also a lot of emphasis on how you eat the food it's all about family every mm. single thing they do has a legend has a story and um so in showing how food is not only about the dish and what it tastes like but what that food means to the people that are producing it that are making it but also how you can bring those lessons those um 
you know, those traditions and those ingredients into your kitchen and enrich, you know, how everybody's kitchen can be enriched by the culture and the food from others, especially uh, from your neighbors, you know. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. Okay, Patty, I'm going to come back to you. I just want to tell people that your show airs um, on WETA. It's distributed by American Public Television. So they can find, they can look for it and find it and yes. watch, watch some full episodes. So I'm going to talk to Mark next. Hi, Mark. Hello, how are you? Hey. Now, Mark, I'm fine. I'm fine. And it's Fennell. It is. That is Fennell. my name, correct? Mark Fennell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. First of all, you have to tell everyone where you're sheltering in place. Come on, you're well, sheltering the furthest. <laughs> I, I am in Australia because... I am Australian, and uh, that's where I am at the moment. It's uh, I think it's just gone eight o'clock in the morning. Um, Good my morning. children, my mm -hmm. children, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. My children are having breakfast and being like weirdly well behaved, okay. and I don't know how long that will last for. So let's embrace it for as long as it does. Okay, okay. So we're prepared for them to barge in any minute. Okay. Yes. So you are the host of It Burns, and mm. um, it's a podcast that you launched last year, even though you shot it in two thousand eighteen. Correct. Yeah, so it came out okay. in April 2019, and it's uh, it's a very strange story. So it turns out that the US, the UK, and Australia have been at war over who can breed the world's hottest chili, and this war has been raging for about 15 years. And I sort of stumbled across it because I live two hours up the road from the people that used to have the Guinness World Record. And uh, it turns out that when you start to delve into the fight for who mm -hmm. can breed the world's hottest chili, it gets very nasty very fast. Uh, there was accusations of cheating. There was death threats. There was uh, there was oh, accusations really? of dodgy laboratory. Yeah, and and I think the moment I sort of worked that out, I the conclusion I made was well, the the, the where I landed was why why is it that people get so obsessive about this? What and also, I mean, these chilies, I mean, I don't know if you've had any of them, but they're so hot that they are sort of, they almost yeah. cease to have any flavor, some of them. The, at the real. Oh, okay. I'm, I know he'll come back. I do like heat. I like pepper, but that's a little too hot. Oh, here he is. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. Hey. I was interested in pain, basically. That sounds creepy, actually, when you take it out of context. But um, we should, we should let everyone know that you are a chili head. That is what you are known as. <laughs> Okay. Apparently, yeah, I, 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 am, I am now. I didn't intend to be, but um, I'd always eaten chili as a kid. My mum's from uh, my mum's Indian from Singapore. Uh, <laughs> this is me demonstrating my love of chilies uh, in Arizona, and I've always I was always raised on chili. My mum and I used to have chili offs when we were kids, and what is a chili I, off? <laughs> well, okay, it's a thing. So what <laughs> happens is we have dueling chilies of raising heat and then we sweat we cry we discuss our deep darkest uh, emotional trauma and that's how we bond it's weird but that's how yeah. we do it wow <laughs> okay <laughs> okay well i think I, I i have to let people listen to this but first of all you won in the broadcast media category for audio programs so let's listen to a clip from the name of the podcast this episode is the scandal plagued race to breed the world's hottest chili here we go this is a massive subculture Every weekend, somewhere in the world, there is a chili festival just like this. And on YouTube, there are thousands of videos viewed millions of times of people blowing their brains out with these peppers. And that group of contestants over there huddled in the rain. They don't know what they're up against. They don't really realize how hot these peppers are. And then on top of that, you're putting level after level that capsaicin just keeps building up in their mouth, it's a lot more than any of them have ever realized and it hits them pretty quick. Wow, wow. Um, I... That was one of the strangest days of my broadcasting life. I stood in the middle of the tail end of a, of a tropical storm in Arizona while these people were just, oh, there, there I am now, and people were, had water drenched down them while they were competing for like, I think they were competing for like $200. Oh my and that God. obsession fascinates me so much. Why would you put yourself through that amount of pain in order to win such a small amount of money <laughs> in the middle of a tropical storm? And then, of course, I had to ask myself the question of holding up this microphone and being like, 
yes, but why am I but, here? Like, what yeah. life choices have brought me to this moment? But you were participating as you were shooting. You were you were even participating. So uh, <laughs> that's yeah, little... yeah, I'm I'm not very smart, and that's what happens. <laughs> Sometimes you just do really dumb things when you're a broadcaster, and. Uh, Look, it was interesting though, because it, it also had like a personal component to me as well. So I feel like I've always had a an unusual relationship with food, as in I probably eat too much of it. Mm. And yeah, I think one of the interesting things that came out of the series that I didn't really expect to explore was was that relationship I had with food. And I think that what's interesting about podcasts as a medium is it actually in it sort of invites you to be a bit vulnerable. It invites you to to share something of yourself and and allow people to buy into it. And I think what's been for me, as the series has come out, has been really amazing is, you know, getting emails from people all around the world, particularly, mm -hmm. I will say, the US, saying that that vulnerability. Oh, okay. We're gonna, it's a five-part series. Um, and I know Mark's going to come back any minute, but it's a five-part series. You can listen to it on Audible. And um, it's... It's fascinating because people do, the, like you said, the strangest things to... Um, to get this high from eating heat, hot, hot peppers. So, okay, we're gonna come back to Mark in a little while. Amanda, are you there? <laughs> You're up next. Okay. Hey, Amanda. Hey. So, Amanda Kluke, nice to see you. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Eater is no stranger to, a J to James Beard Awards, um, but this is the first time a video has won. Yes. And you are not the producer, but you tell us a little bit about your team who actually produced the series. Sure. So the producers behind the our winning series called Handmade uh, is Carla Francescuti and Marillo Ferreira. And we we put together a lot of videos for the Eater page, and we cover a lot of chefs and cooking techniques and all kinds of adventure stories. But this series is really special because it's about the artists. It's about mm -hmm. people who make the ceramics and the copper pots um, and they these passion projects. It's also about foodstuffs like mm -hmm. flour, people who mill flour themselves for their pizzeria or make their own handmade tortillas. So it's more about the artistry than mm -hmm. the food making. And it's about all of these people that kind of live in the orbit of dining that we mm -hmm. don't talk about. And I think it was just an opportunity for them to put together a truly beautiful, beautiful series as filmmakers. It is beautiful. Both are beautiful. So you, there were two, two, um, two, two parts to the two different videos to this handmade series. Uh, the one there is how a ceramics master makes plates for Michelin starred restaurants. That that's the one um, we're going to show in a little while. Uh, but the, and you also had how knives are made for New York's best restaurants. So the, for the ceramics piece, you actually um, went in, you met the gentleman who made the plates for the restaurant Nomad. And mm -hmm. it turns out the, the, the plates, the ceramics are just as important part of the experience of food as the food itself. So let's take a look at that clip. It's super exciting to me that our company is sending 300, 350 pieces out the door every day to a lot of the world's best restaurants. Lots in the US, Canada, South America, in Europe, we're in Australia, in the Middle East now. Occasionally I'll try to figure out how many people eat off my plates every day. Quite a few. We operate almost the same way a kitchen does. We come in early, and you know, what are we making that day? We call that our menu. Start up with the prep, the clay prep, make sure you have the right amount of raw materials, getting the stages ready. So there's definitely like a rhythm to every day. Oh my gosh, gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, the knives, uh, we, the knives, how knives are made. I think we have a couple of photographs from that particular one, but I'm, I'm obsessed with knives lately. Being at home, cooking a whole lot more during this pandemic, my knife is very important. I didn't realize how important. And so, you know, to just hear the maker talk about what goes into, you know, the weight of a knife and the right knife for the right uh, piece of food that you're cooking. And it's just, it was just really beautiful. And um, I, I need to go out and get some knives. <laughs> but that was great. So um, what are some of the other uh, handmade uh, videos that you all have done 
public Well, it's, it's an ongoing theory. So they, one of my favorites was about copper pots mm -hmm. and seeing the physical labor that goes into making a really beautiful handmade copper pot. Right now, our team is in upstate New York. They're filming with a glass blower and they're mm -hmm. also filming a segment on making cast iron pans. So mm -hmm. there's just all these craftsmen out there that I often forget about just as mm -hmm. I'm cooking at home. Mm -hmm. There are beautiful products that um, that artists make and they love food and they love the food world, but they're not necessarily the people we always focus on. Oh, well, again, congratulations. And just so everyone knows, this uh, series, Handmade, won in the broadcast media category for online video and on location. So uh, if you want to see more of their videos, go to the Eater or YouTube channels and you can watch them there. Thank you. So thank you. You are so welcome. So we're going to be circling back. First of all, I want to encourage people to send in questions, any questions or comments that you have for either Amanda, Mark or Patty, and I will ask them as many as I can before we move on. Uh, let's see, we don't have any questions yet, so I'm going to keep the conversation moving, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of food media. So this pandemic has brought a lot of, um, a lot of things, a lot of topics, subjects, concerns to the forefront. And um, it's good, it's good. Conversations need to be had. And, and one of the conversations that um, we're revisiting, because it's not a new conversation, we're revisiting it. So it's re representation in food media. First of all, let's define food media. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you, Amanda, because as editor in chief of Eater, food right. media, that, what, what does that mean? Well, I think now it's so broad. When I started in this business probably 15 years ago, it meant very strictly newspaper sections and big glossy magazines and some food shows here and there, maybe Top Chef, maybe PBS. And now uh, I think it means so much. There are independent newsletters where I get my information. There are Instagram accounts I follow for mm -hmm. my news and food. There are so many podcasts. Um, and so many great TV shows now on Netflix and Hulu and all the other channels. I think um, so. So the the world of food media has exploded. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there's kind of a crisis going on where these um, local food sections and newspapers are they're kind of ret retracting because the business model for traditional media isn't really holding up. It's crumbling. So it's it's interesting to think about what food media is because there's so much shifting all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. The um, did Mark, do you want to elaborate? No, I, I was going to say. I, I, I mean, obviously, I agree with all that. But I think one of the things that is interesting, though, is that you are getting sorts of shows that you just weren't able to make in the past. And I think actually one of the things I love about Handmade is Handmade is shining a light on something that even you know, 10, 15 years ago there wouldn't actually have been a space to do that sort of stuff, certainly not as beautifully made as Eda have made it. And I think one of the things I guess I'm gonna take as encouragement is that because there's so much interest in food in, in the digital space, there are all these opportunities to look at it from different angles. And mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I've tried to do with It Burns and with the new series I've done for Audible um, Nut Jobs is like, can you look at food from a different angle and can you can you make people think about food differently by telling the story of the humans that are attached to it and i think you know it's, it's funny when when we first came up with the idea for it and so many people said but you have to do it on tv because you want to see people you want to see people you know with their sweat rolling down their face and i actually took it as a challenge to see if you can you create that that sense of heat with yeah. sound and i think there's all sorts of interesting challenges and opportunities that have come with all these different new forms of, of telling stories. And I, I guess it's not to suggest, not, it's not to minimize the problems that are being had in, in the industry of which there are many, but I think there are opportunities that come with that as well. So let's talk, I'm gonna ask Patty about this, the lack of diverse people and voices in the food media space. How have, what have you seen change uh, yeah, you, you, so said, I, you talked a little bit about it in the beginning, but what changes yeah. have you seen and, and what can we do differently? Yeah, I mean, so much to be done, so much to be done, Debbie. I think since I, since the time that I started, you know, I switched careers from being a political analyst um, to a cook about 12, 13 years ago. And just like Amanda was saying in the, you know, 
12, 15 years ago, food media was seen as mostly the glossy magazines or the recipes or the very instructional um, videos, episodes. Now, um, using the really noble lens of the kitchen and of food, mm -hmm. food media has become a language where you can communicate absolutely everything and every theme through the lens of food. And I think this opens like a radical, incredibly um, powerful uh, tool for inclusion, for diversity, for sharing stories that are very difficult to share in, in other places and in other ways through food. People mm -hmm. are more willing to bring back walls that would resist certain and, you know, very difficult conversations, which is what we're all talking about now. And I think we should, we all need to harness this opportunity and to embrace this opportunity and to be a lot more bold. And anybody who has been able to create a platform has a responsibility to share the stories and to bring the microphone to the voices that need to be heard. And um, from the time when I started, when there was no Mexican, doing Mexican food, you know, on the TV screen. And it was it was really, Debbie, I think I was sharing this story with you. You know, people kept telling me your accent is too much. Your accent mm -hmm. is too much for Americans. And mm -hmm. I kept saying, but, you know, once they see the food, once they hear the stories, it'll grow on people. It'll grow mm -hmm. on people. <laughs> um, or the looks or what the stereotypes are. Or Mexican food is too ethnic. We can take much of that. And I think a lot of what the media was doing as amanda you know was saying it has to do of course with the business models of of the networks and the magazines and you know the radio networks etc i think now um all of these models are being challenged in a mm -hmm. great way um but i think there's that opening you know and and i think instead of people shying away i think everybody wanted to please the what can america tolerate you know what can people digest and i find that i always pushed and pushed the button with i'm not changing my accent i am going to mexico i am going into the country we are doing these stories with these people that don't even speak English. You know, mm -hmm. I used to translate everything for the camera when we first started the series. And now if you see the new episodes, we don't translate anything. When I'm in Mexico, you see the subtitles, but I think that the American audience, even though there's so much more to do, the yeah. American's palate and appetite to engage more and learn more has widened immensely. So we've come, you know, we've, we've walked important steps, but there's just so much more to be done. So I'm going to ask Amanda this question. Someone, uh, Renee, uh, Matt, I know Renee, she's a friend, and she's um, asking, it seems like food is something we can all get around. Why is representation still lacking? So Amanda, you're, as editor-in-chief, you're a gatekeeper. You yeah. are, you're making those decisions. So what are your, what are fellow editor and chief fellow gatekeepers talking about? How are you all addressing the issue of representation and the la and how to be more inclusive? Well, I think there, the first question is why is it still lacking? And I think it's because there are so many gatekeepers who aren't paying enough attention to it and acting quickly enough. So mm -hmm. you see change happening in this gradual level, but it's not really radical. Like I've been heartened to see, you know, like we work with a couple TV networks and mm -hmm. In the last year, we've been working with so many women of color there in the executive chairs, and like that's huge. That's to see. And I think that is it's huge. Gonna, mm -hmm. it's gonna be a huge difference, and mm -hmm. I think those things are happening, but not really happening quickly. And in these big arenas of power, you still do have the white gatekeeper who might not be thinking about what they need to be thinking about. So, for the next part of your question, is what they need to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually take this moment and put more policies in place to make sure these things happen because there's a lot of people giving lip service to the idea of diversity and representation but not really holding themselves accountable. Um, for us, I think the election was really a big turning point and a wake-up call for us where we started getting much more serious about our coverage but also our own organization because mm -hmm. you need to make sure that the people who work with you and are the editors and the leaders yeah. have the points of view as well. You have to make sure that you aren't assuming your audience is white and that your whole staff isn't white. 
But then mm -hmm. the other part of that is, of course, the coverage and making sure that the stories you're telling are diverse. And also, it's not just the stories, but the experts you're including. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people, yep. that's true. Like you might say, oh, well, we put so-and-so on this list and we check our box. But it's like, who is the expert you are going to every day for a quote? Or if you're, for example, chef's table, why are all the talking heads white in addition to the mm -hmm. chef's Mm -hmm. And so I think there's just so much depth to it that people have to commit to really interrogating. And I just don't know if people put in enough energy into that at this point. Like there's, it's very easy to, to pay the lip service. So pre-COVID, the conversation wasn't really happening. So now that we're in a phase where everyone's looking at rebuilding and it's on the, the, the topic is on the forefront, you're, you're talking about it. You are talking about it with with your fellow fr friends, colleagues, and it's a it's a topic of discussion. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, for the people who were talking about it, I think this mm -hmm. moment is driving them to figure out what they missed. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, this has been our goal for the last five years, why aren't we there yet? Yeah. And, for, and people who have been completely complacent, it's a huge wake up call when they look around the room and say like, oh wait, how mm -hmm. did we end up here? How yeah. did we end up not covering these topics? Yeah. We have a few questions, so let's hold on a second and we're going to jump around and see what, what we got going on here. <laughs> uh, oh my God. Brad, Bradford's question, I don't know if everyone can see is Mark, have you ever refused to try a chili pepper? Um, several of them. Um, one, uh, one of the things that happened across making the series is that I did end up trying all of the, the things that are vying, I guess, in the top five to ten. Um, and they're all unrelentingly awful. Thank you for asking. Um, one thing there was a, I think one thing you have to keep in mind for anybody that's ever considering doing the insanely stupid thing that I did is um, when you have one of these things, it pretty much clears you out for the rest of the day. Like you can't operate as a normal human being, I, I found, for the rest of the day. You're like you've mm -hmm. got hot sweat, you can't breathe properly. And I was driving from South Carolina to North Carolina after mm -hmm. being given one of these things. And I just had to pull over in, in a, like a strip mall and somewhere in the middle and just went, this is my day, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I do just want to pick up on something that Amanda said then. It's like everybody that's involved at every layer of mm -hmm. food media has a responsibility here. Like, so when it came to doing the, the, the second series, you know, I made a, I don't have as much power as, as, as an editor in chief, but I have control over the content of my mm -hmm. show. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a conscious choice to like, let's go explore, not just because um, the new series was about farmers uh, had a, a large farming component. Let's go talk to the workers. Let's, let's look, go talk to the farmers. And it's been interesting in the new series seeing how there's a bit of an audience reaction to say that when you start looking at, at issues of race in food and environment in food, people, there's is, there is a bit of a backlash I've noticed in the audience where people are like, why, why would you make food political? It's like, well, I don't think of it as political. I think mm -hmm. that food is a doorway into human beings and social structures. And if you are going to properly examine food in depth, you can't just pretend that issues of race or issues of environment or issues of politics aren't a part of that. And mm -hmm. I think there's something of a maturing, I think, in, in people's attitude to what food media can be, because I view it as a doorway. I mean, obviously there's there's great food focusing on, on the creation, of, uh, great media focusing on the creation of food, but I also think what's really exciting is can you use food as a, as a, as a stepping stone into bigger worlds? And I think there's incredible pa narrative power in food to do that. And uh, it's interesting seeing how people are reacting to that, I guess, as, as that matures in so many different areas. Okay. Okay. Patty, do, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, like that's, a, <laughs> that's a great question. Okay. So how do we decide where to go in Mexico and where to eat once mm -hmm. we're there? Okay. Mm -hmm. So Patty's Mexican Table started with my wanting to share the Mexico that I missed and that I hankered for and that I was nostalgic for. Mm -hmm. So I started going back to my hometown, Mexico City, and the places that I knew and the foods that I knew because I wanted to share what I knew with people here saying, you don't know all about these, let me share. But as the seasons have moved on, I want to go to places I've never been to. I want to learn about topics and people and regional cuisines that I don't know anything about. So mm -hmm. for me, that's become 
even more fascinating when I take my my audience along with me to to learn new things that are new things for me and for my team. I find that that is the most exciting for my team and my production team. And me as a person, I find that the more I can humble myself, the more fascinated I am and the bigger I feel that I have a mission and a role. Um, and so the last season we went, you, you know, we were filming in Sonora right before COVID hit. And that is a place in Northern Mexico um, neighbors to, to Arizona, a place that I had never been to, a place that I thought I would never get to go to. And just the stories, the people, the food, I mean, so incredibly fascinating. Um, so where do I go next? I go to a place that I know the least about. I started mm -hmm. sharing the places that I knew the most about because I felt stronger there. But mm -hmm. the more we grow, the more I want to go to places that I know nothing about and how do we decide where to eat um it's just a lot of word of mouth a lot of research about what you know the ingredients are of the region and we don't want to just go and sit down in restaurants we want to go to people's homes we want to go and eat whatever the oyster farmer is eating we want to do real and raw and that is what is the most fascinating so i guess we're drawn to the more unknown than the known and and going back a little bit to the theme about the power of food um mm -hmm. and food media debbie i mean i really feel that people in food media and in the food world really we have no excuse in jumping into more substantial things mm -hmm. because food lets you and the kitchen allows you and it is a noble place that really allows for conversation mm -hmm. and for deeper and more difficult conversations to happen so i feel that if you decide to be in food media there's certain responsibility attached to it yeah well, i agree i agree 100 yeah. amanda's asking oh oh this is a question for amanda what are the best knives and can they be purchased by the public I don't know if you can answer that question. So I, but. I pulled this up just for this question. Oh, mm -hmm. For that knife episode, it featured Will Griffin of Griffin Blade yeah. Works mm -hmm. in New York City. So that's the person who hand forges the knives for a lot of New York's best restaurants. So I think you can um, look him up and see what the rates are and if he'll do um, something for the general public. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would like each of you to give me one suggestion of what you think can be done, an actual call to action that can be done at this critical time as we work to rebuild the culinary um, industry. Uh, I think there needs to be radical change in every platform, every network, um, you know, be it commercial or public, they need to have like a set mandate that has a certain percentage of funds of space that will go for inclusion and diversity and those voices that need to be heard. So I think it really has to be structural change. And as you know, um, Amanda and Mark were saying, like this is a time where there's a lot of deep service happen um, is happening and mm -hmm. there just needs to be a commitment from the boards, from the people that direct, from the gatekeepers in saying, you know, it's not a matter of just learning it li and listening. It's a matter of really self introspection, you know, about the organizations and the institutions and, um, research like deep down mm -hmm, mm -hmm. into the history of the place that you have it you know like for me it's public tv my, that's my field that's where i am that's where um my series is and and i'm committed to doing more and more content that goes along those lines so mm -hmm. i think um it's not just about listening and learning it's about enacting and doing that's good point very quick. What about oh you? Oh my gosh, someone just said that they like my accent and I have to say I am so grateful when I hear that because I close so many doors closed on me because of my accent. Mm -hmm. Um and and I feel that it's something that that makes me proud many years later that I never gave into and it's actually the thing that my kids make the most fun 
Um, <laughs> well, that's what kids do. They are boring. <laughs> they're there to harass you. So. These are totally fun. So really um, I, I mock, I mock their Spanish, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, Mark, what's one call to action that you would, uh, uh, I think, would ask for? I guess from from my standpoint, it comes down to talent development. I think sometimes the job of getting more diverse voices in in any kind of media is making sure that there is a pipeline of talent and that talent feels supported as they're coming through. So it's about um, picking out people who um, who have an interesting voice, who maybe I, one of the con sort of conversations I get into a lot, because I, I work with a, a not-for-profit uh, about media diversity here in Australia, and one of the biggest issues we find is that um, you know, young journalists coming through um, often they get bounced out of hostile work environments pretty quickly and they go do something else. And what I've sort of realised is not enough to kind of create positions for people or to give people a commission. They've also got to be supported and have their voice invested in. And when we when I say invest in their voice, it's about investing in their perspective because that's really the important thing. That, that, that That's your end game. Your end game is to have a food media and indeed a media in general that, is accommodating of different um, worldviews because people have had different life experiences and that actually enriches us all. Mm -hmm. Sounds great in theory, but in practice, what it's about is about making sure that particularly when you're re recruiting younger voices or newer voices or voices that are marginalised, it's making sure that you don't just give them an opportunity, you support them and you develop them so that they can become the next, you know, the next stars of whatever, mm -hmm. or the next, you know, incredible columnist or TV show host or podcast host. It's about making sure that they, uh, an environment that is, has traditionally been so hostile to so many marginalised voices, you, you are actually dealing with the environment as well as creating the opportunities. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Amanda's nodding, so I think she, uh, oh, okay, are, you agreeing, are you agreeing <laughs> with that? <laughs> what? Yeah. What my call to action would be, it's it's kind of like in the weeds and boring unless you really run a big team, but like really looking at the recruiting process and to Mark's point, the retention mm. process. If you, mm -hmm. like I have so many hiring managers, not just with me, but in any industry saying, well, the pipeline isn't there. It's like, you're not looking, you are not talking to the right yes. people in the right mm -hmm. network. You're right, exactly. You have to do the work. You have to do the yeah. research. You know, yeah. The job and we feel mm -hmm. like square one and it's because we haven't been doing the work every day to build those connections and mm -hmm. go to the conferences and get coffee with the right people mm -hmm. now we're starting from a you know a handicap space if we don't we're not ready so we should be ready every time we have a job opening or every time we have a column opening to be like oh of course i know i already mm -hmm. know yeah. and then, you know i talk a lot about recruitment and my staff has said to me like what about us what about mm -hmm. Like we're here, why aren't you paying as much attention to helping us navigate this world that we're in and this company that we're in when we might not have the shorthand to survive it in the way that other people do? And so that's mm -hmm. something that any manager has to be really conscious of. Like, are there ways that other people are getting ahead and someone who might come from a different background just might not be able to navigate it as well? Are you paying attention to that? Are you cognizant of it? And just mm -hmm. be very intentional about the people that you already did take the time to recruit to make and sure. And I think they be. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry, Patty. We we can hear you. Sorry, Amanda. No. Up. Oh, she's frozen. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Continue, Amanda. I'm sorry. No, that, was, that, was, that was that was it. It's just that like was it. Okay. In retention, um, and then you can work on the coverage. But I think the thing is that so much of that work is it's quiet and it's private and you don't get to boast about it, but you just have to do it if you really want to see change on the other side. Here's That's such a good point qu though. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it's such a good point though about the boasting because so much, there's so much, uh, I guess, lip service and there's, there's so many companies that love to talk about how diverse and inclusion, inclusive they are, but then you actually talk to the people that work there and hey, their experiences and like just because they, they they have a nice group photo and everybody's a different color doesn't actually mean the experience of those of those people that work in those environments mm -hmm. is any less hostile. And I think it's it's really it's the really unsexy behind the scenes work of making sure your work culture, mm -hmm. your um, your commissioning culture um, is is actually inclusive that you can't boast about. And you in some ways you shouldn't be able to boast about because it shouldn't have to be a thing that you boast about. I think that's the hard work that, that needs to be done. And as a result, often doesn't get talked about nearly enough. But we have Patty back. 
<laughs> we are, you know what? 45 minutes has flown by. <laughs> so time is, time is going. I want to ask two, a couple of more questions and we're going to wrap it up. Um, the shows, uh, some, this is an interesting question for Amanda. I don't know if you can answer, but I'll, someone on, you, on YouTube is asking, is it possible gatekeepers don't even know what they're gatekeeping? Um, I'm probably, yes, absolutely. I think people like to point the finger at others and might not mm -hmm. be interrogating their own role in this because they might not be the, the big boss or the executive um, at a TV studio. But mm -hmm. Mark's point earlier, everybody has a role to play if you are creating food media or if you do have any kind of connections or stories that you can tell. So I think there are probably a lot of people that don't even think about the role that they're playing. Okay. okay. Um, Patty, you had something you wanted to say that when you, when we, you froze. Yeah. So yeah, what did you want to say? <laughs> I was just looking at that question that you just asked. Oh, um, okay. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say that, that I think that is one of the, most important things that many people are just used to working in the same way every day and not questioning which is what we were saying about researching mm -hmm. and and i think that the hardest thing is to do work that you're not going to boast about and that people can't compliment but it's work that you need to do on a daily basis or you know when people ask me about you know where I stand on political issues, like when Trump announced that he was going to build the wall, you know, mm -hmm. I kept telling people, you know, if you look at my work and you look at the seasons and you look at the episodes, you can see what I think about Mexicans, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That, that, that says it all. Because you don't jump and scream. Because I, I think, you know, when a lot of these situations happen, there's people that want to be loud and scream and, and there's there's people that choose to work every day on a mission on content and you can do both as well mm -hmm. yeah. i think yeah. not doing whatever it is just to get the attention mm -hmm. i just i i don't have much respect for that you know mm. well i mean yeah, i so think true. it's important to yeah but i just think that the people that just jump on the opportunity just now but then mm -hmm. pay lip service to it do yeah. anything about it i just think it has to be a constant even if people don't get the acknowledgement it's a good point that's a good point patty i am um, i hate to end this conversation because it's going so well but um but i'm going to wrap it up by asking you about your next project so mark what are you working on next um, well, we just put out, I think I mentioned earlier, we just put out a new series uh, on Audible called Nut Jobs, uh, which is about a, a $10 million heist of nuts in the state of California. And oh. that, mm -hmm. in the process of doing that, it sort of, in, uh, it opens up a whole bunch of doorways into how food is made and how food is grown. Uh, at the moment, uh, I am, I'm literally not allowed to leave the country. None of us are allowed to leave the country. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, Zoom interviews on a new project about, um, about stolen animals. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's about all I can say. Like, okay, that's a good teaser. I, I that's, weird jobs. Yeah. that's a good teaser. Um, Patty, what are you working on next? So we're now finishing the next season of Patty's Mexican Table, which focuses on Arizona and Sonora and the connections between these two countries working together, two states, two cultures, and reaching each other. And, and also working on my next book, which has to do with shining a light on how Mexicans enrich the American table. Oh, that's that's great. That is good. And and Amanda, what is what's next for you? I mean, I think our constant priority right now is just trying to cover this industry as it goes through probably the hardest challenge it will ever face. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, trying to keep my staff sane while they're doing it because everyone is you know sheltering in place and kind of cracking and it's an intense mm -hmm. moment to be covering um, any kind of news right now. So that's, that's the big thing. And then on a brighter note, we have a show coming out with Hulu in the fall that's oh. all traveling to beautiful cities and we finished shooting just in time. So it's very eerie to watch the episodes um, as they're finishing post-production, um, but it's actually kind of a nice escape to remember that time before everything kind of wow. Cleared. And to think about what shooting is going to look like in the new normal is just, it's a lot. It's a lot. Well, I want to thank our winner. Well, I'm, I'm shooting oh. TV shows. At, yeah, I'm go just ahead, Mark. Say I'm mm -hmm. shooting TV shows at the moment, and it's incredibly weird, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> oh. 
Yeah, we're all gonna we're gonna be dealing with that. So, I want to thank thank you all our winners for taking part in this episode of the James Beard Media Awards at Home presented by Capital One. I want you all to be safe. And everyone watching, please follow them on social media, follow GBF on social media if you wanna continue the conversation. Um, in the meantime, I want to stay home, stay safe, and join us on July 29th for our next discussion. Anyway, be good, talk to you later. Thank you, Debbie. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.